I've been a member here. This has been my home church since I was born, from First Allison Avenue Baptist to here, until God called me into the ministry and used me elsewhere. So I am very grateful and honored to be invited to be here this morning. I sat back here wondering what kind of changes there were in the church since the last time I was here. And I watched the service start. I watched the young man lead us at the beginning. And then the praise man took over. And then I heard a voice. And I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And I kept looking up and I said, awesome. They've got God to introduce the music. But I want to thank you for allowing me to be here. Today I come up with a sermon title. I hope it sparked a little bit of interest in you. Do you think God feels his age? How many here feel your age? Oh, if you haven't put your hand up, just wait. I'm 74. What is considered old? When I was a teenager, 30 was ancient. Then I became 30. And I said, well, that's not so bad. Then I became 40. And to make me feel better, people told me, well, 40 is the new 30. And then when I turned 50, they said 50 is the new 30. And when I turned 60, I knew they were just kidding with me. If you don't have aches and pains when you get up in the morning, just see me after the service and I'll explain to you what it's like. Someday the biggest blessing is to be able to put both feet on the floor and stand up. I mean no disrespect if I take a drink of water as I speak. A couple years ago, I had salivary gland cancer which required a very extensive amount of surgery on the side of my face. They put me all back together and now that's my photogenic side. So if you want to take a picture of me, I'd appreciate it if you go from that direction. But in doing that, they had to remove my salivary glands. And so I have a dry throat. And so if I don't drink water, eventually I'll sound like Daffy Duck up here. Age is something we each have to deal with from when we're very young to as we get older. A few gentlemen that I would like to give you a quote is, you are never too old to set a goal or dream a new dream. And that was C.S. Lewis. Another is preparing for old age should begin not later than one's teens. A life which is empty of purpose until 65 will not suddenly become filled on retirement. And that was Dwight L. Moody. And then my final one is, those who love deeply never grow old. They may die of old age, but they die young. Benjamin Franklin. I believe that we should look at our golden years, and I've redefined what golden years really mean as if God is bestowing an honor on us. Each day that he allows us to continue in life is one more day that we have to serve him. And there is no greater, no greater thing we can do than to serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Some people feel as we get older, having been a pastor for so many years, when asking somebody if they would be willing to do a certain ministry in the church, I would hear the words, well, I've done that before. It's somebody else's turn. There are no turns in the ministry of Jesus Christ. If he calls you to ministry at the age of 70, walk boldly. If he calls you into the ministry at 80, consider privileged. And if he calls you into the ministry at 90, you must be a very special person. Age is a number that re represents a span from beginning to end. In order to determine age, there must be a beginning. We as human beings count age, 
beginning with our birthdays. The moment a baby is born, we start counting. It has been seven days since he was born, we say. So he is one week old, two months old, four years old. The time of a person's lifespan always begins at the date of his or her birth. In asking if God feels his age, God has no age. He has no beginning, and he will have no end. He is outside of time. So the question, how old is God, is insignificant. The fact that we acknowledge time is God's blessing to us, because he didn't need it. He sees everything as if it's happening right now. But we needed something to judge our days by, whether it's hours, minutes, years. Since I've retired, I've done more funerals than when I was in the active pastor of Friendship Community Church. I average one to two a week. My generation is passing away. We're being called home. But when I talk of age, and you always think of somebody being old as being 80, 90, even 100. Some people say, well, I'm young. Time is on my side. I don't need to make him a decision for Christ. That, if I did that, life would be so boring. How many that have Jesus in their heart figure life is boring? Shouldn't be one. He keeps life very, very interesting. Around each turn is an opportunity to serve, and you never know who it's to. In asking if God considers his age, we ask the question, does he think of himself as being old? That means we assign earthly Excuse me, earthly. I lost my voice. There we are. Am I okay? I don't have my headset on. Can you hear me now? I'll just stick to here. And asking if we think God feels his age, we, whether we realize it or not, we start to apply human attributes on God. We know that he is, has no age. He'll, he's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. We know that he doesn't look at age as being anything that applies to him, but it's just for us. But when we ask the question, do you think he feels his age, we apply an earthly attribute to him. And so, follow me on this little exercise, which will only take a couple seconds. I want you to close your eyes. And now I want you to picture God. What does he look like? To each of us, it might be a little different. But what does God look like to you? You can open your eyes now. I don't want anybody to fall asleep. Do you picture an old man? Do you picture a white beard? Do you picture somebody that has been sitting on the throne so long that the seat just conforms to him? Do you picture a guy that when he stands up is bent over like so many of us get as we get older? You see, those are all human attributes. Those are things that we realize and sometimes we try to put on God. He's been around since the beginning of time. He's had to put up with me for 74 years and that would weigh on anybody. I'm not the same as I was 10 years ago. I'm not the same as I was five years ago. 
every day I redefine what life is and enjoy it for all it's worth. But you see, as we apply attributes of human origin to God, whether you realize it or not, we put him in a box. We're in a box. Now, when we were young, when I was 20, I was going to live forever. I, had a, I was in a big box. I could do anything. Get a little older, start losing the ability to do some things, my box started getting smaller. And now, I have a pretty small box. It's pretty cool, but it's a small box. But what I see in society, even with Christians, is that as the years have went by, as we've heard the world's message that there is no God, that you're crazy for meeting like this on Sunday morning, wouldn't you much rather be golfing? My answer would always be no. This is where we need to be. Amongst brothers and sisters. Amongst the family. Somebody we can rely on. I'm sure you feel like you could rely on anybody that's here tonight. And you should be able to. For when we come together, the presence of God is with us. Some people view God as they view their parents. Did your dad ever disappoint you? Was your mom sometimes a little hard on you? I've known a lot of people that wouldn't, wouldn't take on God as their savior because if mom and dad treated me like that, then what's he gonna do? If you would ask me even now, I was the father of two wonderful children, was I the perfect father? No. Did I disappoint? Yes. Did I mean to? No. But I wasn't perfect. There's only one that's perfect. And when we call on our Heavenly Father, we call on the perfect one. The perfect one. We look at God through our parents or loved ones, and that's a problem. In the box that we put him in, would you agree that in this world things are getting worse? and worse and worse. I hardly watch the news anymore because just when I believe it couldn't get any worse, guess what happens? It does. It does. Doubt has passed around us from the world. What can we believe? Who can we believe? Is God really as great as I thought when I was young? When I was young, God could do anything. God was there all the time. And my faith is still in him. My faith is still strong in him. But because of the messages that we constantly get bombed with, that come to us day and night through the news, media, and everything else, who we think of God gets watered down a little bit each year. And then there's the question, is God really who he says he is? Absolutely. Questions also asked, I'm older now. My problems are bigger. Can God handle that? The fact that I, someone would even ask the question, means that there's doubt there. I feel like I'm slipping. I remember the, the old saying where a wife looks over at her husband as they're driving down the road. She says, honey, we used to sit together when we drove all the time. And her husband looks over and says, I haven't moved. You see, God hasn't moved. We have. We've allowed ourselves to be pushed just a little bit further away from Him. So we feel like we're slipping. 
We've made God, God human with human weaknesses, and yet he has not changed, but we have. I want to take you to the book of Revelation. I'm not so much going to talk about the end times. That's a study all for itself. And many of you have already been through those Bible studies. But I want you to listen to these words, and I'm going to read most of the chapter. So it starts off with verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. You see, John was given the privilege of being able to look into heaven, to see heaven for what it is and to see Jesus Christ for who he is. I would consider that to be a great privilege, but I don't know if I'd ever want to do that. Because something tells me that if I looked into heaven and saw it for what heaven's really like, and then was sent back, I would not be a happy camper to have to put up with all this that's around here, knowing what is ahead. Verse 3 says, Blessed is he that readeth. Now this is the beatitude of Revelation. And you know the beatitudes all start out with blessed. And said, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. We need to realize that since Christ ascended into heaven, we have been living in the end days. I've talked to so many people that know I'm a pastor, and their question, they are so mad. Why has not God returned? I've even heard the comment that if he doesn't come soon, he's going to owe Sodom and Gore an apology. Cities that were destroyed because of sin. And I look at them and I smile. And I said, there's only one reason he has not returned yet. And they said, well, what's that? I said, to give the opportunity for one more person to accept his son and to receive eternal life. For he would have that none of us would perish, not one. John, in a lot of his books, introduces himself. So it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so. Amen. It says he has made us kings and priests unto his Father. Is that the way you feel sitting where you're at right now? Do you consider that you are worthy of the honor of being a priest, a king, a daughter of the Lord? Well, you are, by God's word. And in Revelation, Lord, verse 8, which is the main verse to concentrate on here. It says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
which means he was imprisoned on this island because of his belief in Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, <coughs> excuse me, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira, and Sardis, and Philadelphia, and into Laodicea. Just to pause there for a second. In counseling people and talking to people that would come to the church and say, I want to come worship here, or I'd like to be a member here. Well, my main concern would be their soul rather than their talk. And so I would ask them, what is your relationship with Jesus Christ? And they'd lean back and they'd smile and they'd say, oh, Jesus and I are buddies. I could put my arm around him and we would just walk and talk. Let's see how close the coming description of God not only matches what you saw when you closed your eyes, but what matches somebody saying, oh, Jesus is just my buddy. So to go on with verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake me, and beginning turned, and I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was the sun shineth in his strength. Now John was in Jesus' inner circle. He was his closest. If anybody could have said, Jesus is my buddy, it would have been him. But upon being able to look into heaven and see Jesus for who he is right now, we have the following verse. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of hell and of death. And he says, Write these things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Does that sound like your buddy? Buddy, that's a human attribute. I assigned that to Jesus. He's my buddy. There's different people here that I can say, they're my buddy. But I could never say Jesus is my buddy. He is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Does he feel his age? No, he doesn't know age. When we ask the question, we put him in a box. And so here's the question. Is there any box big enough to hold God? No. Can God create anything bigger than himself? No. He created his son, which is equal to himself. He has the Holy Spirit, and the three of them together make up the Trinity. And they all work, and they're all there for us, as we should be there for them. At times I have found a lot of people that are afraid of the book of Revelation. After reading this about your Savior, aren't you encouraged? John looked upon him for the first time, not as a buddy, 
but as God. He fell face first into the dirt, not worthy to look upon him. And Jesus lifted him up. Don't be afraid. I am who I am. I'm going to introduce you to a word. Immutability. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's a word I haven't heard of too much. But this is the meaning of it. A characteristic of God signifying that he does not change in his basic nature. In him there is no variation or shadow of turning. God does not mutate from being one kind of God to being another, nor is he subject to limitations of time and space, since in Christ he upholds all things by the word of his power. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is the God of steadfast love. And so once again, the words from Revelation 1.8, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. In this world today, I can tell you with total confidence, he still heals the lame. He still causes the blind to see, the sick to get well, and he causes cold hearts to soften and invite him in. And I believe with all my heart, miracles still happen. I'm often asked, why don't we see the miracles as we see in the New Testament, where everyone that Jesus touched was healed? There's a reason for that. Back then, he needed signs and wonders to get the attention of people, to show them that he was the Son of God. And through these miracles, which they say there were many more than what was recorded, he showed the world and gave everyone the opportunity to believe. Today, we have something just as important we have his word. Do we need the signs and wonders to believe? I believe every day that we're alive is a sign and wonder. But we look for the supernatural, just as the people and the Jews in the New Testament. Oh, show us another one, show us another one, show us another one. And he said, I've shown you, but you don't believe. So one more won't make a difference. The Bible even says, blessed are those that have seen and believed, but more so of those that have not seen and believed. And that's us. We need to believe in his word. We need to know that miracles still happen. But what has changed in the world through all these years is sometimes our faith and our ability to believe. In Matthew 9, it talks about him healing the blind. It says in chapter 9, verse 28, when he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and they, he asked them, do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. So he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, will it be done in you? And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, see that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news all about him all over the region. If you were cured of blindness, would you keep it to yourself? That's why they didn't. A miracle. Matthew 21, 22 says, if you believe, you'll receive whatever you ask for in prayer. I used to be a consultant for Standard Publishing Company, which is a Sunday school publisher. And there was a day I had a seminar up in Youngstown, Ohio. When I went up there, part of the seminar was a young lady that lived up there, and we took the opportunity just to sit down and talk. And she shared a story with me. She said, I prayed to God that he would allow me to see the world around me 
for what it really is. And he did. And I never wanted to leave my house again. She saw around her the spiritual battles that were going on. She saw the true nature of crime, of evil, and it scared her. But the important thing was her prayer was answered. And on that day, she took the strength and the courage to come out to hear whatever needed to be said, but to share her story. The blind men were first asked, do you believe that I am able to do this? I don't know what's going on in each of your lives. Problems with family, work, relationships. But God is bigger than your situation. In verse chapter 11 of Mark, it says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. How many times have we asked God for something and then the next day we ask him again and the next day we ask him again and I tell people when you ask God of something in your heart you believe your prayer has been answered and you turn and you walk away from and you let God be God. Because the verse continues on to say, if you have doubt, you're like a double-minded man, confused and not knowing where they're going. So in your situation, I would ask you, just as Jesus asked the, the blind men, do you believe that God can heal your situation? And I hope that by the end of this service, you would be able to say with total confidence, yes. I had mentioned I've done quite a few funerals. I've done funerals for individuals that were not saved. And I've had people come up to me and say, how can you do a funeral for somebody that wasn't saved? I just smile and say, because the service is not for them. What do you mean? Their decisions were all made while they were still alive. There is no changing that. But those that are sitting in front of me today, as long as they draw a breath, have the ability to decide to have Jesus Christ in their life. I've been asked, what would you rather do, funerals or weddings? They're thinking that answer is rather obvious. And I say funerals. They look kind of weird and step back and I say, why? I says, because when I do a wedding, nobody listens to me. I said, the bride and groom won't even remember their vows 10 minutes after it's over. They're already at the reception. They're just wondering how long that bald guy's going to keep talking. But a funeral, everybody's wondering about how much longer I have on this earth and how precious each day is, and they listen intently, whether they act on those words or up to them. But it's up to me to share these words. And so, the funeral of a non-believer is a very solemn and sad service. There is hope in Jesus Christ, but the hope is not for the one that passed on. But a service like I had just this past week, a service of believers where they knew exactly where their loved one was and is and will be forever. There is a totally different feeling. It is no longer a service of celebrating death, but of celebrating life, celebrating decisions that were made at a certain time in their life. And the whole family is blessed because of this. And so your decision to be a believer is a blessing to your family. Because the percentage that we're going to die one day is 100%. We don't know when, but it's there. In 
in James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. God allowed his son to come to earth. Let's make it personal for you. I don't know all your names. In fact, I don't know most of your names. But Jesus knows every name. He came for you. Were you worth it? Were you worth going to the cross for? Were you worth getting beated, beating beyond recognition? Were you worth having the life drained out of him to the last drop? Were you worth it when he gave his soul over to his father, saying, it is finished? I can smile and say, yes, you and I were worth it over no reason other than Jesus loved us. We had the my wife and I had the Christian bookstore Gospel Treasures for a number of years here in Washington. We had a picture in our store that I just loved. It seems a little odd, but it showed Jesus on the cross in the agony of being tortured, made fun of. And then standing in front of him was the Roman soldiers. And behind them were the disciples. And then behind them were other people, but the dress has changed just a little bit, become more modern. And it just kept backing up and backing up and backing up, and the dress of everybody became more modern, more modern, modern, until you realized it was the dress of today, people standing there. And then you saw astronauts and, and different things that we recognize today, but all there at the crucifixion. The reason for that is he saw through all time. He is looking into this sanctuary right now. He sees each and every one of us, our spirit, our motives, what our life is like. And we all deserve the words that we heard him say when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Meaning no matter who they are and what they're going through, they are worth it. And for believers of all time, Christ went to the cross. And he sees you. He sees me. And my prayer is that I am worthy of that sight. I am worthy of his being here. Looking for that blessed hope, Titus 2 and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Blessed hope is not just hope. It's not hope like, I hope it doesn't rain today. Or I hope that we don't have another 90 degree day. Or I hope I feel good. Or I hope I don't have aches and pains. The blessed hope is the fact that when you pass, you're going home. It's not a question, it's a fact. People that I asked, are you saved? And they say, I think so. I say, you better be more than just I think so. You have to know so. I have a question for you. What makes a best friend? You may think, well, that's an odd question. Think of it. Who's your best friend? A name should come to mind. best friend is somebody that you spend time with. It's somebody that even if you haven't seen them in several years, when you do, it is as if no time passed at all. Your best friends. How many of you spend as much time with God as you do with your best friend? How many of you talk to him every day? I've had people come up and say, I don't know how to talk to God. 
I don't know how to pray. I said, you're talking to me. He said, that's, that's different. You're not God. I said, God's ear is more receptive to what you're saying than probably I am. He doesn't want, she says, well, I don't know how to pray in these and thou's. I said, you don't have to. Talk to him like you know him. He already knows all about you. Can't hide anything from him. But he loves to hear your voice. Why? Look at the sacrifice he gave for you. To watch his son upon the cross. A blessed hope in knowing that Jesus is always there. On my desk at the store we had, I had a special coffee cup. Not simply because I like to drink coffee, but because it had a Bible verse on it. Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord the God, thy God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Is that the way we think of God? Behold, I am the Lord thy God, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And I hope that right now your answer is no. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to come and speak here today. I'm not exactly sure how much time they have given me, but I hope I haven't wore out my welcome. It was important for you to realize how special this church is to me, how special you are to me, and to be given one last time a chance to stand behind this pulpit. And there was a time where I stood behind it every Sunday for a year. You have great things ahead of you. You have a man that I've heard good things about. And so with your future, I would say greater things are ahead. Look with great expectation. Trust in the Lord and know that nothing is too great for him. No matter what your age, when the new pastor comes, I want you to stand up and say, what can I do? What can I do? In essence, you're saying, what can I do for God? But it would be an encouragement to him. I can tell you that with experience. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm sure that's the first time you ever heard that, isn't it? I just made it up. No, I didn't. So repeat with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to thank the three people that did. We live in the most unusual and exciting days of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Why? because he's close to coming back. And where do you want to be when that trumpet blows? You want to be out playing golf on the golf course or sitting in the pew? You want to be in prayer with the Father or wondering what you're going to have for supper? I want to be close. The Bible says we are to be in communion with him. 24 hours, seven days a week. Talking to him, waiting on him, loving him for all our worth. I don't know, I may be letting you out earlier or not, but I'd like for you to bow our head with me and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to share your word. Thank you for the privilege of being able to stand here 
in my home church. I ask your blessing upon all those who can hear my words. That you would place your hand upon their shoulder. That you would make sure that each and every one know that you are alive. And you're alive for all time. Father, until the day you return, will you instill in us the nature of your ministry and the way we can serve. For I ask this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Thank you.